Hello, fellow ag nerds. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hamrich, and if you're interested in where innovative ideas meet practical realities in food production, you have found the right show. We have a great episode for you here today about how farmers are finding ways to develop their own ag technologies by building open source communities. I've done a few of these episodes on open source before, and it's really inspiring to me to see farmers who have always found ways to sort of hack together solutions for their own problems do the same with digital technologies as well. Today's episode focuses on GPS-based technologies, including mapping, section control, auto steer, and making their own tractors autonomous. These technologies exist in the marketplace, sure, but what you're going to hear is how our guest and his open source community are finding ways to make them for themselves much cheaper and more tailored to their individual needs. If this concept of open source is new or a little bit nascent still to you, you are going to learn a ton today. But if I could just start with maybe an oversimplified definition, it's when a software or other product is created, then the process of creating that product, i.e. the source code, is shared publicly and is open for others to take, use, and add on to. Successful open source projects inspire communities of people to form around them and to continue iterating and constantly improving the product. You'll hear our guest today compare it to a cookie, where instead of trying to keep that recipe a secret so you can sell more and more cookies, you make the recipe public so everyone can not only use it for themselves, but also improve it along the way. You're about to hear a great example of how all of that looks in practice. Brian Tischler is on the show. He's a farmer in Alberta, Canada. He farms with his neighbor, who he shares equipment with to cover a combined 2,500 acres of wheat, barley, oats, canola, flax, and peas. Brian started his career in the medical technology industry, which you're about to hear more about, but then he bought his family's farm when his dad was ready to retire in the mid-90s. He's going to share how he started out, learning how to build software to solve a basic problem he had on his farm, and how that led to a community of now thousands of people around the world who are part of what is now an open source project called Ag Open GPS. It's a pretty incredible project, but I'm going to let him tell the story. So here is my interview with Brian Tischler of Ag Open GPS. Yeah, I grew up on this farm and then went to college, took electronics engineering technology and specialized in biomedical and microcontrollers. And then had a life away from the farm of working in hospitals. My main focus was respiratory intensive care units, coronary care units, heart lung bypasses machines, endoscopy, you know, hemodialysis, all those, those really interesting areas. And that equipment is next level high tech. It's more than just the equipment. That equipment is connected to someone's grandmother or someone's father and it cannot fail. And so when you said a machine was ready to go, you made sure it was ready to go. So being and working on equipment, that really set up for my life that when you fix something, make sure it works. And that's carried over through my whole life. I bought the farm and I've been farming here since. It was difficult to leave that environment where I I really flourish in a group of professionals working together to solve a problem and problem solving and incident investigation. Things go wrong in medicine as well. Uh, Working in that group environment, it was quite a culture shock to come to a farm and be alone. That was very different. And then five, six years ago, I got really, really sick, like close to death kind of sick. And that also made me kind of ask myself, okay, what are you doing in life? You know, time is short. And uh, I was stuck at home. I was immunocompromised, that sort of thing. And so then I started programming. And that's how Ag Open GPS start is just being stuck at home. What can I do? I can uh, do some programming that benefited the farm. It benefited me. I mean, all along, I was always into computers. I use C++ and that sort of thing. I wrote games and, you know, useless. <laughs> Not that games are useless. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, useless to the far. Something that was my business focused. And could I write software that was a benefit to the farm? And we really had a need. We seed with a disk type seed drill. 
and we had GPS in the tractor, but you couldn't see where you went and kind of where you had to go when you were turning around, that sort of thing, to line up the tractor. So there was mapping software and that sort of thing. And we had RTK in the tractor, which is a very precise form of GPS. And I thought, well, how about I learn what GPS is? I knew nothing about it. I didn't know just nothing about GPS. So I just started learning and what the sentences, the NMEA sentences coming out of the machine, what it means. It's it's marine applications. It's aeronautical applications. GPS is, is worldwide. So I started decoding the sentences and uh, just started programming in C Sharp. I hadn't ever programmed in C Sharp before. It was, you know, a more modern language. And I was able to take that information and put it in a Windows program. And I had other experience from gaming with using OpenGL, which is a graphics package. So I just had a little thingy on the screen and it mapped where I had been. So that was probably a good five years ago now. And so now we could see where we had seated. And then it was on Combine Forum and just started putting the project on there. And it was extremely rudimentary. And somebody said, well, can you do section control? I was like, no, you can't do that. Like, that's a way too complicated. And I was like, well, I didn't know how to do it. And the guy says, well, it's all about suggestions. You know, just you can get stuck thinking on this line to say, no, you can't do it. And one of the guys says, well, I can see on the screen where it's green and where it's not. And I'm like, of course. So then I just used the graphics package to determine what was painted green and what wasn't. And then now I had section control. And explain what section control is to the (laughs) non-farmer. All right. When you're seeding and you're going down the field, you don't want to seed that spot again. Or you make some rounds around the outside of the field, which is called the headland, and you turn around. You want to turn the seed or the spray or the application that you're doing. You want to turn it on precisely so that when the product hits the ground, it continues on where you left off. So you're controlling the machine on off very accurately. And because GPS knows where it is, where you've been and where you're going, it allows the software then to control that machine precisely. And so those are the first two applications that eventually led to Ag Open GPS was, you know, knowing where you planted and section control. (laughs) That was, that was definitely beginning. I, we used that for about a year the first time and it worked flawless in terms of, of the hardware, you know, air seeder type section control is quite expensive and you're looking at thousands and thousands of dollars. And in the end, it was $19 for a little tiny Arduino microcomputer and a relay pack for about six bucks. So I effectively then connected that to the serial port of my tablet and connected the tablet to the GPS. And I had section control for like 30 bucks. And it worked flawless. That little Arduino ran every day and never missed a beat and worked perfectly, never missed a spot. So that was the initial project was to take really simple, effectively hobbyist type electronics and apply it to agriculture, which it was predominantly a very proprietary, expensive. I think that there's a realization there that you don't have to spend thousands of dollars, that maybe the equipment is priced for profit. You know, when you look inside and what it does, when you step outside of something like GPS or section control, all you're doing is turning a piece of equipment off and on. How expensive should that be? You know, when you look at consumer electronics, yes, they make more of them, but consumer electronics is very much the same way. It's potentially a little more complicated inside, but how expensive should it be? So that was also kind of the driving factor. I didn't want to buy section control. I thought if I could build it for 30 bucks, well, this is a good deal for me. Because I, I would have never bought it, right? I would have just always manually flicked the switch on at the wrong time. You know, you you definitely want to default too soon and that sort of thing. So it allowed me to have that section control. Like we don't farm a lot of land, so cost is certainly a consideration. So that was the initial project, just being able to see where we were and turn the machine off and on and do it with simple basic hardware. And when you posted that on the Combine Forum, was that post basically, 
hey, look what I found. You can buy these two pieces of hardware and all you need to do is this and you have, you know, what eventually became section control as well, I guess. Is that how that post looked? And, you know, talk a little bit about how that becomes a project, because at that point, it's just kind of like a cool thing to, to do and share, right? It is. And that it was quite simple because the Arduino was designed for children in school. Our society has come to the point where everything is becoming a black box, even your car. You know, people do not even know how an engine works. They don't need to know. So the, the whole concept of the Arduino was to allow school kids, elementary kids, to be able to understand the internal workings of a microcontroller, basic input, output, that sort of thing. And because it's really simple, it allows just this world of possibilities. You know, it becomes a major tool of the toolbox. So I thought, okay, well, this is really simple. And not all farmers are, are super technical, that sort of thing. So what I did is I created a YouTube video where my wife built it. She put it all together, just followed the directions. And she made section control, hooked it up, and we put it on YouTube. So effectively, <laughs> you know, my wife is, is not mechanically inclined. And she built the thing, got it working, loaded the software, and she had section control. I mean, it got thousands of views, of course. So then kind of knew we had something. Like if anybody could build this, anybody could screw it together, then now we had something worth pursuing. Right. And then what gave you the inspiration to take it somewhere from there? I guess my, my question in a crude way is just why didn't it just end there? Because, I mean, that's awesome and it's great. But what led it in future directions as well? Well, then the next question is, can it guide my tractor? Can it steer my tractor for me? And same sort of thing, oh, I can't do that. So then I just started programming because five years ago when I did a, a search on open source agriculture, Google come up with nothing, right? There was no inkling of how auto steer worked online. You know how you can search for something like, how does an alternator work? You know, or, you know, how does a car work? How does a transmission work? You can search and you can find out all the information. When it came to algorithms and that sort of thing for auto steer, nothing existed. So just sat down with a blank piece of paper and, okay, what do we want to do? We want to follow a line from A to B. And again, we had the GPS. We knew where the line was and how far are we off the line and can we steer it back onto the line? And that was really the start of it. Go for GPS is when it could steer. And then initially it just started doing a B line where you could create an a B line and then jump across the field. And what, what auto steer does is it, if you have a, a 40 foot piece of equipment, you want to line every 40 feet so that when you get to the end of the field, you turn around and the line jumps over 40 feet again. And then you follow that line and you just, you know, zebra pattern back and forth across the field very, very accurately. What that does is it allows an operator to just sit there instead of focusing really hard. It might go a little over a little because you don't want to overlap seed. You don't want to miss seed. So that allows the machine to run by itself with the operator just there to turn around at the end of the field. And that reduces fatigue. We have to farm the crops in the amount of time that we have. So why not make it easier? So auto steer, I was what, 25 years it's been out now sort of thing. I think it's still one of the greatest advancements in agriculture is auto steer because you're not constantly steering and that fatigue that comes from, from driving and repetitive stress injuries, you know, it, it's not only a, a good thing to have, it's a good safe thing to have as well. And farmer health, that's why it's on everything now because it's a piece of technology that didn't need to be sold it absolutely sold itself, which is rare. So that, that's where it began. And then not only just following straight lines, but curved lines or what's called contour. When you, you drive a squiggly line and then you can come back and follow beside that squiggly line again. And then you can make that squiggly line all the way across the field if you want. It didn't have to be straight. It could be curved. And from there, it just progressed to what's called auto headland. We just call it U-turn. Uh, where you get to the end of the field, how about we just make the tractor make a loop and then come back on the next line? Then you don't even have to touch the tractor at all. 
And there were manufacturers that had played around with that idea. But five years ago, that really didn't exist in the real world. John Deere had made some in the, in the late 90s, but whether it was liability, because now the tractor is being controlled completely by the software. But I didn't have any liability issues. So at the end of the line or by the headland, just detect where the headland is and make the tractor go around like a keyhole shape and head back the other way. And it got to the point where once you did the headland and made your first AB line, you were sleeping for the whole field. <laughs> well, I, I think that liability point's a really good one too, because I, I think it's a good argument for an open source approach. If you have big companies or, or companies with a bunch of investment dollars that have a lot to lose, you know, could lose everything theoretically, it holds back innovation, right? Absolutely. I was concerned about my liability by putting the software online on is a, a website called GitHub, which is like a large repository of you can put your uh, your source code and your information on the program and everything. It's all in one place that everyone has access to to download your software. So if I was making software that, you know, could drive a tractor and something went wrong, the thing went across the highway and killed a busload of nuns what was my liability? And I can put as many disclaimers as I want on it, but as you well know, once once the lawyers get involved, everybody's fair game. So that, that's that been a, and it still is a, a large concern. I still don't know what my liabilities are. You know, there's a disclaimer on there that it's not to be used on real equipment, that it's a it's an example of, of programming and not to be used in a real world of either on or off-road. So that's about the best I can do. You know, it's like, no, you're not supposed to use it. It's just how to learn how to do. But <laughs> thousands and thousands of people do use it. But they, they take the, the accountability of use it. Absolutely. It, it sounds like, you know, from the very beginning, when you posted that first project, you started to see very early on the benefits of open source in terms of other people showing up and saying, hey, we could do section control with this. Did that continue? And I'm just curious about how that contributed to the advancement into, you know, the autonomy of kind of the open source auto steer, I guess you could say. Well, I think in software, sometimes you you write a program and you think, well, you know, that's that's good enough. This is where we should leave it. But with driving the tractor and trying to automate more and more of its functions, and just working by myself on the software, it was invaluable to have people post things like I originally started out and said, well, you can see where it's green. I can see where it's green, can't the computer? And sharing your ideas and sharing the software and having people contribute, like, like not just people, but, but farmers from all over the world and giving ideas, giving suggestions. I mean, not all suggestions are good. <laughs> Like, like Grant is like, oh, that's just a ridiculous idea. But some of them, like the green and not green one, they twig a new idea or just a feature that, yeah, I can do that. I never thought about that. And there's nothing more powerful than a group of humans trying to address a problem or wanting a feature. And I've seen this over and over and over. Again, getting back to the medical, right, where you have a a room full of nurses and doctors and immunologists and everybody in a room together thinking and solving about a problem coming from all these different directions. You know, you have those people working together, but now with the internet, we can make that room as big as we want. And if we have now thousands and thousands of farmers looking at a problem or testing software, whether that's becomes we control tram lines, you know, like traffic controlled farming. People do that in Canada because people were doing it in Australia. The collection of ideas and that network of ideas coming together, you know, inspires more and more thought. And when it comes to agriculture and open source, open source is the fundamental process of sharing. I should talk about what source is. Source is like a recipe. You can have your cookie. The cookie is the software. And the cookie recipe is the source code. You know, you add your butter, your sugar, your chocolate chips, your flour, that sort of thing. That's the source code. And now somebody comes along and says, I want to change the source code. I want to add Smarties. 
right? Now that we got an improvement. Now we have a monster cookie. So allowing people to, to look at the, the source code or the recipe and add it and change it opens up the possibility for more ideas. And this is something that manufacturers really don't do because they want to protect it all. They don't want other companies to, to steal it and take it. So their recipe is hidden in the drawer. All you see is the cookie. Whereas open source says, here's the recipe, let's make it better. What do you want the cookie to look like in the end? And then we can change the recipe to make it look like the cookie we want. And so everybody has ideas on the recipe, which can be good and it can be bad because you don't want to put garlic in with your cookie. Because, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a different cookie, but it's not a better cookie. So I think that's where the community says, no, garlic's a bad idea. So that community then needs to, to be like a family and have their squabbles and fight it out and, and figure out what's good and what's bad and what's best for the community. So when we talk about an open source community, we're talking about a developmental group of like-minded people trying to improve a product. And that's what, again, what Ag Open GPS is. We have an agricultural software package that is designed to guide your tractor and control piece of equipment and do documentation. How can we make it better? And how are those people finding the project? Are they finding it on GitHub? How are they finding it? And then I'm also curious about what you've noticed in terms of what motivates these people to get involved? You know, because nobody's out here trying to build a billion dollar startup with this, or maybe they are, but I, I, it seems like they're more interested in just solving a problem. And, and I'm just curious if that's what's motivating them. What's motivating them? You know, the biggest uptake has been in Europe. They basically just have smaller equipment. They have smaller farms. That's not a bad thing. That, that's actually a really good thing. A lot of farmers in Europe, they don't just farm. They have other things. They can't afford the GPS software or they can't afford auto steer. They could if they really absolutely wanted to. And, and some do. They could spend $10,000 or 15,000 euro on a, a full RTK guide system because they want to do tram lines. They want to be really accurate. They could do that. But what's really driving it is, hey, if they can build it for a thousand euro, I can have auto steer. If Ag Open GPS didn't exist, I wouldn't have auto steer. Auto steer is the greatest thing in agriculture, <laughs> you know. So for them to be able to make straight tram lines and have all the benefits of auto steer and GPS and have it really inexpensive and have access to it, oh, you have an endless supply of, call it, customers. You know, people with, with great passion because it changes their lives and they love it. And they put it on everything. I've seen from all over the world these really, really old tractors and in there is a Windows tablet, you know, with, with two antennas and full RTK on the tractor. You know, so absolutely, these people are beyond passionate about Ag Open GPS. Like, it, it's fascinating. And to have section control and the mapping and the, I mean, a lot of, they call it documentation where they'll have different varieties of different vegetable crops and to be able to annotate that. Uh, these guys are going 0.7 kilometers an hour, right? And a lot of auto steers don't work that slow. Ag Open GPS, no problem like for vegetable planting and vegetable work. This stuff is going super slow, but it still works. And we can program it now to not be a North American farm tractor that, you know, is 100 feet wide type tool going, you know, six, seven miles an hour. Now we're talking about a, a one meter tool going 0.7 kilometers an hour. So we just tweak the software and make it work. So providing opportunity and technology for farmers that I think that would have never had it. And from that, the numbers of thank yous that, you know, people say that I could have never done this. So that part is really exciting. And, and that's, you know, that's pretty heartwarming to hear that sort of thing. It's like, yeah, this changed how we farm. And are there people in the community that had zero sort of programming background but have learned quite a bit in order to be able to contribute on that front of, of the project? Well, that's part two. It's a very basic hands-on project. And 
I, we can talk about that too, where it's going and where we'd like to see it go. But basically, yeah, you could buy an Arduino, you can order a PC board, solder all the components, put it together, wire it up, follow instructions, and you have auto steer. There, there's people, they were selling individual boards, a uh, fellow named Andreas. I, I should talk about our development committee now too. But selling a board where all you do is you hook it up, hook it to the computer, wire it up, you have auto steer. You know, it's become simpler and simpler and simpler to do. And, you know, that has been the key. And that as we make that more and more modular, more and more complete as a, you know, I don't want to call it a marketable product, but a, a less technical requirement product, then more people will use it. I mean, I'm sure there's some people that just get frustrated that, well, it didn't work for me, that sort of thing. You know, and they may be missing one thing. But with the forums and Telegram and all these other social media type interactions, you know, people are very quick to help. Now, Telegram is kind of a, a chat-based software that allows people from all over the world, you know, it's like WhatsApp or all these other different apps. It's like a text version of Facebook. And people could just join. We created a single international group on Telegram and we just started posting questions. There was originally a fellow by the name of Andreas. He's from Austria. He's, the, he's our GPS guy. He finds out all about the new GPSs. You can buy for like $150 now a basic GPS module that'll receive GPS signals and tell you where you are. You can add a second one and create a full RTK base station and dual antenna. With dual antenna, you can, you can not only tell your position, but where you're heading. So very, very accurately. So for uh, you know, a few hundred dollars or a few hundred euro, you can create your own RTK network and using free software, using the internet, using airways. You can create your own full centimeter accurate GPS RTK system for just a few hundred dollars now. There's no reason to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to buy subscriptions for companies that put out RTK when you can just build it for a few hundred dollars yourself. The self-driving car market and the potential for that has really made high quality GPS quite cost effective because with numbers comes decrease in cost in production. So the, the GPS is covered and there's so many companies coming up with really, really good products now. So we have a core development group. We all work together to just kind of make it better and better. And so they're kind of the core of the community. And then the community, you know, we, we send out some new software and we can have thousands of farmers all over the world testing it. And within a day, we know what all the problems are because these guys have thoroughly tested it from many different situations and it's amazing 10 people can or the core group can test that software and it'll run perfect you put it out in the real world and the problems come back and it's like none of us have this problem but it's a problem and so again that's where the, the larger community can test software and they just love doing it it's, it's almost like a, a challenge to find a problem because it, it's quite good software. It's very, very reliable. And to find a challenge or to come up with a new idea from the larger community is a good thing. No, it's substantial for sure. What's next? You know, what, where, where do you see this going next? And uh, obviously, as you've talked about, the community will kind of determine that to an extent. But I'm curious, what's on your mind? Oh, a thousand things. I think that the guidance software is really good right now. You know, it, it does everything that you kind of want it to do. There's some little add-ons, but I see where I want to head is more of the computer vision aspect. When you're doing vegetables and horticultural, you want to be able to, to see with a computer exactly where that piece of machinery is, to not only steer the tractor, but also steer the, the planter or the tool behind it. And using convert or to till or to manage that horticultural crop you need computer vision to see where the plants are. We don't really need to identify the weed. We just need to identify the crop and take care of everything else is kind of my theory. And I, I think that we continue to use herbicides 
And herbicides are not a bad thing, but we're running into more and more resistance issues. And we really, really need to focus on, you know, our core fundamental of agriculture is plant a crop and remove everything that isn't the crop. And to continue to rely on herbicides that are, in most cases, 30, 40 years old and very few new ones coming along, we need to definitely explore and look into other ways of removing weeds. So that that's kind of where where my pull is right now is to, you know, just make sure I go for GPS keeps going, but to spend my time focusing on computer vision and agriculture, be that guidance, be that weed ID. There's some fascinating stuff on using high voltage to control weeds. And I think we could just take it one step further and to utilize a ionic liquid, you know, basically like vinegar and ammonia mixed together. It's got lots of electrons rather than trying to dig the weed or spray it or that sort of thing. Blanket the weeds or blanket the entire crop or even just between the, the rows of the crop with a solution with lots of electrons and then zap the individual weeds. Or even just squirt the weed, zap the weed. And if you have a robot doing it out there working on its own, you don't have to be there. Then time isn't really as much of a factor. It's not like you're going out there, you have to spray that quarter in two hours. Well, no, just let the machine go do it for two days and just work day and night. What are the the next steps toward that end? Is it, you know, trying to build more of these communities? Is it trying to, you know, I'm, I'm just curious of like, I totally see the vision you're casting here, but I'm wondering what's next to getting there? That's, believe it or not, an easy question. <laughs> I, I see this, my goal for this winter is to, is to get help universities, government, that sort of thing. A couple of years ago, the Saskatchewan versus province beside us, they had a large technology and ag meeting and all the, the top CEO level of communication companies, agriculture companies, all the levels of government were there. And what do we do? What we need is a home, is a repository for the ideas, for the collection, the dissemination of information. And that's not going to come from a group of farmers who do this on the side. That's going to come with with dollars either from university or dollars from government. And we need to create a home. We need to create a vision of where this should go. And with COVID and stuff like that, it, it, it's difficult to, to get people in a room. It's impossible to get people in a room. But it, it's something that we, we need to lay the groundwork for is can we and or do we want to do this? Do we want to coordinate the things that make sense in agriculture to combine, to be open source, to be community, to come to amass data, like, like we're saying, like weeds or, or soil types and you know, soil performance? Do we want to standardize and make, make that information singular? And can we further some of these projects with help from universities, you know, just, just make them infinitely better with you know, much smarter people. I mean, we're just a bunch of hack farmers and look what we've done. Now, you know, you can add some experience and some professional from industry and some really smart people from universities get that next level of ideas together. So I, I kind of see that's where the future is. And, and again, tackling some of our future problems and future challenges that let's face it, nobody's working on. That's where I see the future. You'd mentioned earlier that five years ago or so, you did a Google search for open source ag tech projects and zero come up. What's that look like today? What's the landscape look like for open source ag? Thousands of hits. It's been amazing to see it grow. We have access to incredible technology that's very easy to use for ridiculously low prices. So how can that not spur innovation. I don't think the technology is our limiting factor. It's just just a few ideas on how to use it. Like, like what a great time to be alive. <laughs> you know, where we can take simple, easy to program products and make agricultural leaps ahead in technology. So what do we need? We need people to take on more of these projects, take some ideas, take the time, and, and learn what you need to learn, take that good idea and make it happen. 
I mean, if there's one thing I could really encourage farmers to do is, is look into some of the stuff, think about the problem that you have on your farm and think about how you can solve that problem. How can you do your own section control on your own mapping? You can't just, well, you can, but you shouldn't just go through the years of, of farming and say, you know, that's still a problem. Well, we have the tools, we have community, not just one country, not, it's not just Canada or it's not just the United States. We have the, the planet connected now with, uh, with this discourse form and things like, like weed ID. Well, it's going to be farmers who are going to be taking the pictures for, for weed identification. You know, it's not going to be companies. So if farmers are taken all the time identifying weeds and taking pictures of it, should it not then be open source? Should the entire weed ID library be like Google Maps, where it becomes public and all the, all the businesses come from accessing that basic weed ID API or that programming interface? You know, these are some big questions that as this technology is up and coming, we, we need to think about, you know, or, or soil maps. You know, how great would it be to have our entire country with an open source soil map? You know, we know what the production is of every square, square foot or square meter of land. And so then does the commerce then come from accessing that open source map? How much greater would it be to have all of these agronomic companies using the same data rather than piecemeal in their own format and my neighbor can't, you know, he buys my quarter. Well, he doesn't have my particular format of data. Now they start from scratch again. We're amassing all of this data, but are we doing it in a coordinated fashion? There's a lot of big questions. Wow, what a strong ending to a great episode. Thanks so much to Brian Tischler for being on today's show. Go check out Ag Open GPS online, and I'll definitely leave a link directly to it in the show notes. And make sure you give Brian a shout out on Twitter, if you don't mind, for all the great work he's doing. He's at eFarmerDot. So the letter E, the word farmer, and then the word dot, D-O-T. I could have talked to Brian for hours, and I actually had to edit out quite a bit of our conversation because I kept him for a long time when we were doing this interview. But I do want to at least mention that he was very quick to point to other members of the Ag Open GPS community for their contributions, including some specifically that are really core members, such as Andreas, who he did mention in the episode, Richard Clausen, who is the website and ideas guy, Yop, who is a talented coder and provides a lot of feedback on that end, and Vili, a Caledonia-based graphic artist. These are just a few of the core community members, but there are thousands all around the world who are collaborating on this project. Oh, and one more thing. I know I'm running out of time, but one more thing I'll link in the show notes is there's a video on YouTube of Brian skiing behind his autonomous tractor that, of course, is running on the technology that he helped develop. So very cool. If you enjoyed this episode, stay tuned for next week where I'll be profiling another interesting open source project called the Open Weed Locator or OWL for short. A lot of what Brian shared, especially those final comments there are a great segue into that episode. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Thanks so much for your time and your attention. I never take it for granted. I'll be back next week with another story of open source ag innovation. Innovation.